Hello, my mass enthusiasts. Okay, so we have officially come to the end of the Massverse reading challenge month. I literally have just finished House of Sky and Breath, Crescent City, book two. I started this reading challenge on the 1st of January. I wanted to do the entire ex currently existing uh, Sarah J. Mass universe. Uh, so I was a total of 14 books and 8,351 pages, and I am so happy to declare that I have done it. Challenge complete, and I even have a few days to spare before the next installment of Crescent City comes out, House of Flame and Shadow, which is on the 30th of January. I am filming this on the 26th of January, so I know I'm going to be kicking myself because I'm going to be in a reading slump now until the next book comes out. I can't bring myself to dip into any other books, standalone or otherwise, because I want to keep my head in the game. With that in mind, I have obviously been, especially in the Crescent City books, but across all the other ones as well, I have been tabbing like mental highlighting in these ones like right onto the page because I got these in paperback specifically so I could be a little bit more heavy handed as far as like using actual highlighters on the paper and making handwritten notes on the pages because I'm a bit too Sheldon to do it with my hardbacks. I use the tabs on my hardbacks but I can't bear to do anything else. Rereading the entire series from Assassin's Blade through to Kingdom of Ash a Court of Thorns and Roses, all the way through to A Court of Silver Flames. Like, not leaving the universe has been really useful, actually, in, in finding these sort of correlations and Easter eggs and threads, what could be, what couldn't be, so on and so forth. With that in mind, if you are still in the middle of any of these series, please do not watch the video from here on out because I will be going into all of my theories thus far um, and there's definitely spoilers, a lot of spoilers. There will be Throne of Glass spoilers, there will be Akatar spoilers, and there will be Crescent City spoilers. So please, 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 I do not want to ruin the the universe of SJ Mass for anybody. I want you all to read for the first time and have that same sort of ah moments, nice and un uninfringed and unruined. And I, I would hate to be the cause of that. So please, if you're not finished or you don't want spoilers, don't watch from this point on. Okay. I am going to be going through each of my tapping points from the Crescent City series. Just parts that jump out at me, or jumped out at me, and so on and so forth. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. We're going to start with House of Earth and Blood. <laughs> so one of the first things I've highlighted in this, obviously going in, I did this, I've obviously read this a few times before, so... Jessica Roga. Bryce Quinlan's boss at the Antiquities place, um, was it Griffin Antiquities? So she is obviously far older than what she lets on to be. It is also dropped in House of Sky and Breath that Jessaba Roga hasn't 
always been known as that. Even the Under King doesn't know her as Jessica Roga. So she's over 15,000 years old. She even speaks to Adis in cat form at the very end of this book and tells him not to screw them over again. So she was part of the war 15,000 years prior. So either I'm thinking that she might be one of the priestesses from Parthos or more likely as she has powers but defected from the witches now calls herself like a sorceress. I think she's Fae. In the world of Akatar, also in the world of Throne of Glass but in a different way. So let's let's stick with Akatar a second. There's all these questions that are voiced and points made about witches. People who amass power beyond what the cauldron or mother gifted them with. Now, we all know that Nesta Artron took from the cauldron but gave back. But there are also beings which are hinted at that are just witches full stop. And I think Jessaba is from Prithian. I think she's either related to or part of the Night Court or the Middle where the old magic still runs. And I think she amassed power beyond maybe what she was naturally gifted with. But when the war and all that happened, happened then, which is slightly touched upon in Silver Flames, I think they were called the Daglon, Daglon. They were overthrown. Now the Daglon or Daglon, they are the Asteri from these books. Maybe not the exact same Asteri, but they are the same race. And if she remembers battling them that in that war, then she's got to be a part of that world somehow. Either that world or originally Parthos before it became Midgard. And the Asteri happened. Not to mention she knows, knew, and was fond of, if not the lover of, Hunt's father. Obviously Hunt has no idea who his father is. And we also find out that Hunt was bred to kill demons. And Thur, which is some kind of thunder god, is always depicted and described as looking to be a lot like Hunt. So I'm wondering if he's not some kind of thunder god. I know some of this might seem a little wishy-washy, but I am just spitballing, just going through what I've picked out. So please do bear with me. The gate that represents the bone quarter in Crescent City is made of onyx. And it says onyx so black it gobbled the light. Now, Black stone that the gods greatly feared. That is brought up in Throne of Glass. And black stone is brought up a couple times in the world of Akatar. You have a black stone box that the sorcerer at the lake or the death god, uh, what's his name? Nope, his name's gone right now. But eldest brother to the bone carver and brother to the weaver. I really can't. Kosche. There it is. Kosche, who cursed the sixth human queen to be a firebird. She mentions that he has a black stone box, which is his most precious possession. Now, obviously they don't drop the word onyx or anything like that, but it's black stone. And obviously the word keys were black stone that were hewn from the word gates. The word gates allow travel between the worlds. Fury Axtar. I think as she's never properly explored at this point, I think going into book three of Crescent City, I think we're going to dive into a little bit more depth of Fury Axtar. I think that she is some kind of relation to Amran from Akatar. 
Maybe she went through a rip in the world following Amran or trying to follow Amran, but ended up elsewhere. Or she ended up in Prithian, fought in the war and ended up in Midgard. They look very similar. And perhaps Amran melded herself to look like Axtar when she escaped the prison. The fact that Fury got sniffed out by Danica and Danica just wanted to understand, which means Danica had never come across anything like her before. Just like Amran is the only one of her kind in Prithian. I think Fury is the only one of her kind in Midgard. And the fact that Fury is an assassin. And that a whole lot of the high players in Midgard, like the Viper Queen and Jessica Roga, seem to fear her. Just like how Amran is feared in Prithian by the vast majority of all of them prior to her yielding everything to win that war against Highburn in the third book. Something else I picked up. So chapter 10, Bryce mentions a partial marble relief from the ruins of Mora, salvaged from a wrecked temple. Now, Mora was the sister to Mab. Mora and Mab, the sister fey queens from Aurelia, throne of glass. Because this was found in an ancient temple in Midgard, I'm wondering if this isn't Aurelia, just obviously much, much later. Luna, who is portrayed with bows and arrows and hounds at her feet. And in Aurelia, you have Diana, who was, when she was Faye, Mab was the one who became Diana when she died, if I remember rightly. Goddess of the hunt. And the fact that Mora is portrayed in this world, it can't be a coincidence. Either that, or when Aelin puts the keys back into the gate at the end of Kingdom of Ash, and she says about seeing a world of rolling green hills that these gods go back into, and then she rips open a door to what I believe is hell, where that beast was that she initially faced at the end of Throne of Glass with Kaol. No, wasn't Throne of Glass. My bad. Crown of Midnight. I believe she ripped open a world to, to a, well, she didn't rip it open that time. She, she opened a door to hell after Nehemia. So she goes looking for Nehemia, opens a door, speaks to Nehemia briefly. Nehemia disappears and then a symbol gets changed. And when that symbol is changed, I think the door opens to hell and that nasty beastie comes through, which then pulls Fleetfoot through, so on and so forth. With that in mind, like I said, Aelin puts the keys back in the gate, she sends the gods back to the world and then she opens up that rip to that same world. What if that world was Midgard? or Parthos. That would explain why Mora, or a representation of Mora, would be found in a world other than Aurelia. And maybe it was Aelin who created the northern and southern rips in that world, which is why demons keep managing to creep through. And another piece that's brought up that is um, inside Griffin Antiquities. The intricate jade puzzle box that had once belonged to a princess in a forgotten northern land. 
Hmm. <laughs> what princess? Granted, she was a queen at the end, yes, but princess in a forgotten northern land. What if this princess was one of the daughters of Aelin and Rowan? Because we all know that Rowan had that dream where he could see Aelin round with child, but also surrounded by children, both sons and daughters. And all these mentions of Orrerys. Not in the Throne of Glass, granted, but in Crescent City, and Reese also has one. And it is touched on in House of Silver Flames. Or no, sorry. Ha la 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 la. A Court of Silver Flames. But Reese has an orrery as well, of their universe. And it is explained at the end of House of Sky and Breath that all of the creatures of Midgard are fey. Shifters, wolves, even the angels, fey. So you have the Avalon fey on that mist-shrouded isle that even the Asteri's magic can't pierce and all that. So the Avalon fey hailed from Prithian. And that would also include Bryce and her brother and all of them. But then there is the secondary fae, the other location, and these are the fae that encompass the wolves and the other shifters. Now, what is it that the fae, pure-blooded fae for the most part, only some of the half-breed fae can do it, but in the world of Aurelia, or Throne of Glass, what is it fae can do besides wield some kind of power? They can shift. Granted, their forms are unknown until they shift, and they can only shift into that singular form. But at the, in Kingdom of Ash, they also touch on the tribes of the hinterlands with the massive wolves and all that kind of stuff. So I think that the secondary type of thing are from Aurelia, are from that world. Again, throughout all of the series, you hear the lines, like calls to like. Something tells me it's really gonna bite us in the ass when like calls to like and reveals itself. And obviously the number seven, the number seven throughout the whole thing, throughout the universe seems to be like a big thing. Seven is staring seven hills in the eternal city, seven neighborhoods and seven gates, seven planets, seven circles of hell, seven princes who ruled them, and again, as I said, seven high lords in Prithian, seven fake kings. Real obsession with seven. A lot of the books in the library, Griffin Antiquities, Library of Parthos says so she hadn't been able to read most of the books since they were in a long dead language or in codes so clever only highly trained linguists or historians might decipher them. But I'm thinking that they're in word marks. So why I think Luna is the same as Diana. Luna sat in a carved golden throne. The goddess lovingly rendered in shimmering moonstone, a silver tiara of a full moon held by two crescent ones, graced her upswept curling hair. At her sandaled feet lay twin wolves, their bale for eyes, daring any pilgrim to come closer. Across the back of her throne, a bow of solid gold had been slung, its quiver full of silver arrows. Aelin was given an arrow of Diana at the winter solstice in Throne of Glass. The illustration of the carved horn lifted to the lips of a helmeted fame male who was pristine as it had been when inked millennia ago. Above the figure gleamed an eight-pointed star. So we know that the eight points of the star is the emblem of the starborn. We know that this is what the shape is that comes up on Bryce's chest when she wields her starlight at the end of the first book when she closes the gates. 
Eight points the star also comes up in Silver Flames when Nesta and Cassian make their bargain with each other and the star is then tattooed upon their backs. And I believe Eight Pointed Star also comes up in the Valkyrie training when they're being taught how to wield the sword in the same way the Valkyries did. Going back to the languages of the books, titles were in common language, the old language of the Fae, the Mer, and a few other alphabets he didn't recognize. Rune reached for a blue tome whose spine glittered with gold foil, words of the gods, and he was not allowed to touch it. There were stories in great romances of the Fae, which touched on the starborn history and starborn power. Prince Peleus and his bride, Lady Helena. Peleus was actually the high general for a fey queen named Thea. Helena was her daughter. And it sounds like Queen Thea was also starborn and her daughter possessed the same power. Thea had a younger daughter with the same gift, but only Lady Helena gets mentioned. Night-haired Helena from whose golden skin poured starlight and shadows. It gets revealed that before Rhys and his family ruled the Night Court, it was Moore's family who ruled. Moore doesn't have, she has the, she is the Morrigan, her gift is truth. Some of her family wield darkness, like the Darkbringers. But there's no, never ever any mention of starlight. The starlight gifts must have all gone through the crossing with the war 15,000 years prior. Yeah, the Fae and Avalon, they say they can wield darkness and they can mind speak and read other people's minds. But there's never ever ever any mention of them being able to do the same sort of tweaking that the Daimati can do. And it's the same in Throne of Glass. There's no Daimati. Closest thing to it is what Maeve can do by altering people's minds and tugging on certain things. I thought for a little while that maybe the Asteri were Volg. Volg that had been cut off from their home planet. I mean, it would make sense. And the Sphinxes are an odd bunch as well. So there's 12 of them in Midgard. And there are the oracles and seers. And the Sphinxes, they reside in black stone temples, which, if we consider what we know of black stone and onyx, usually means something to do with word, the gates of word or the word. And the Sphinx also refers to Hunt as the Lord of Lightning. So it makes me think he might be Thur, or of Thur's bloodline, which would make him a god of sorts, maybe a demigod. Something closer to immortal than what the Fae or the Malachim are. Coming back to the witches again, there is a lot of similarity and the witches from Throne of Glass. Not the Iron Teeth, but the Crockens. They were a strange, unique group, the witches. Though they look like humans, their considerable magic and long lives marked them as Vanir. Their power mostly passed through the female line, all of them deemed Civitas. The power was inherited from some ancient source that witches claimed was a three faced goddess. But witches did pop up in non-magical families every now and then. Their gifts were varied from seers to warriors to potion makers. That reminds me, so the seers seem to be kind of like the blue bloods and the yellow legs. The warriors remind me of the black beaks and potion makers make me think, and the healers make me think of the Krokens. So another reason to think that Aurelia and the Vogue 
is connected via this as well. And then you have the Gorsian stones, which sounds a lot like the Fabane. And that stone that came from Highburn that negates magic as well. And then we have the Star Sword, which is obviously oh. the pair to Truth Teller. And they are clearly worlds apart, but they are a matching pair. The sword was part of a pair. A long bladed knife was forged from the iridium mined from the same meteorite which fell on our old world. The world the Fae had left to travel through the northern rift and into Midgard, but we lost the knife eons ago. Even the Fae archives have no record of how it might have been lost, but it seems to have been some time during the first wars. It's another of the Fae's countless inane prophecy. When knife and sword are reunited, so shall our people be. And we know Bryce obviously has reunited those swords when she fell through the archway and back into Prithian, which that means will then reunite the people. And he even explains, he says to Hunt, you do realize that it might not be my people. The Northern Rift opens to other places, other realms, yes, but other planets as well. What is hell but a distant planet bound to yours by a ripple in space and time? And then he says, your kind, fallen, meaning hunt, were made in Midgard by the Asteri. But the Fae, the Shifters, and many others came from their own worlds. The universe is massive. Some believe it has no end, or that our universe might be one in a multitude, as bountiful as the stars in the sky or a sand on a beach. When Aelin put those gods back in their world, when she did put that rip through, I think, I think that might have been Midgard. And going back to Fury again. Fury Axar was Liquid Knight. She made herself infamous for knowing the world's secrets. Just like Amran. Amran seems she's so old because of when she went through that rip into Prithian, she knows so many secrets of the world. They are of the same ilk, I'm sure of it. Fat Jessica has the Arcesian amulets, the majority of what is left in the world, and they are 15,000 years old. They are from Parthos. She was either one of those high priestesses from Parthos in the temple that fled with the books, or she came over from Prithian to aid. We'll definitely be getting more on Jessica. She's part of the House of Flame and Shadow. She apparently only answers to the Ender King, so we should get some answers. The horn tattooed on Bryce's back. To look at the lines in that ancient, unreadable alphabet and to know that even with everything gone to hell, it still remained. I think the horn was tattooed on her back in word marks. So the books in Jessaba's library, banned titles, only supposed to exist in the Asteri archives which would then dictate or suggest that there are multiple copies. Evolution mathematics theories to disprove the superiority of the Vanir and Asteri. Some from philosophers people claimed existed before the Asteri. The Archesian amulets, the amulet of the priestesses who once served and guarded Parthos. During the first wars, when the Asteri gave the order, it was at Parthos that a doomed human army made its final stand against the Vanir to save proof of what they were before the rifts opened, to save the books. A hundred thousand humans marched that day knowing they would die and lose the war. All to buy the priestesses time to grab the most vital volumes, they loaded them onto ships and vanished. This is why I think Jessaba is either one of those priestesses or came through from Prithian to help the priestesses. Maybe she, mm, something from the middle. It's got to do some, it's something to do with raw magic and witchcraft. Especially if she was part of the witches and defected. There's got to be a reason for that. A record of 2,000 years of human knowledge before the Asteri arrived. 
And then the language on Bryce is bad. The language is beyond that of this world. It is the language of the universe and it spells out a direct command to activate the horn through a blast of raw power upon the tattoo itself. Just as it once did for the Starborn Pris. So some of the titles on the Divine Number, so we've not heard of that one yet, The Walking Dead, we definitely know of. So there's either more than one copy, as this is as is suggested by Micah in the Asteri archives. The Book of Breathings, which we know Feyre threw into the broken pieces of the cauldron when it opened up that void. And The Queen with Many Faces. We haven't heard of that one. Rise possessed the light of a star, such as hadn't been witnessed since the first wars. Jessica looked like she had seen a ghost. Fury gaped at the screen when the flare dimmed Hunt's breath caught in his throat. So Jessica looked like she had seen a ghost. So she knew the old Starborn from the first wars. So again, she was either a priestess or someone from Prithian. Then, when Hunt slayed Sandriel at the summit, angels in the room all knelt to one knee and bowed, even wide-eyed Isaiah Tiberian. No one on the planet had that sort of power. No one had seen it fully unleashed in centuries. I am so sure Hunt is some kind of god of thunder. I mean, the world they live in is called Midgard. Like, come on. Thor. Thur. And you have the gates and the ley lines of energy. If you connect up those ley lines, they make a six-pointed star. And we'll come back to that, because the six-pointed star is explained in House of Sky and Breath, and because, because it represents balance. And for one of that magnitude to be embedded in the city, it's gotta represent something big. It can be done, it can be used for something very big. In House of Sky and Breath, Hypaxia, Queen of the Witches, uses that to summon Connor, or trying to summon Connor Holstrom with her necromancy skills. Therefore, it's not a stretch to not assume but theorize that it can that one of that size could be used to summon something very big like I would say an army if it wasn't for the fact that Bryce already has the horn and can open doors very easily but then Aelin she put the keys back into the gate you gotta wonder if any of that residual power is left that allows her to walk between the worlds. And I think Bryce might end up going back to that world if, in fact, Midgard is not that world, but going to Aelin's world, Aurelia, to get them to fight for the shifter side of the Fae in Midgard. And because Bryce got her power from the gate, or the gates, I wonder if it can't be melded. And she just hasn't learned how to do it yet, but if she can't wield it and meld it in different ways. Because when Danica gives her that boost back towards the surface after she made the drop, she says she was sea and sky and stone and blood and wings and earth and stars and darkness and light and bone and flame, which she sent that encompasses every single house in Midgard, every single core of power. Her power shifted, dancing between forms and gifts. She thrust upward with a push of a mighty tail, twisted and rose with a sweep of vast wings. She was all things and yet herself. So I wonder, kind of like Feyre, being made of all seven courts, if Bryce in herself isn't now made. But of all the houses. 
And then there's the big debate around Bryce and Hunt being true mates. I believe that they are. Everything that is put in these books thus far is exactly the same as the way mates are portrayed in both Aurelia and Prithian. So his power felt it coming a moment later, recognized her like seeing itself in a mirror, like calls to like. She was warm and she was safe and she was home. When Feyre dies at the end of Akatar and she's grasping on, she, like to the bond. Obviously at the time she didn't know it was a mating bond, she thought it was the bargain between her and Reese. But she says home. Home was at the end of that bridge, at the end of that bond. So there's correlation. Okay. Moving on to sky and breath. So the Thunderbirds. Hunt does make a point of saying that he's not a Thunderbird. And it is also pointed out that the Asteri have hunted them to what they thought was extinction, but also obviously Sophie Renask was half Thunderbird. Now, if my theory that Hunt is some form of either god or demigod of thunder, or Thur, if he's not a god of thunder, maybe he's unknowingly something that is far closer to a pure-blooded Thunderbird or something more powerful, but of the same same type of magic as, as a Thunderbird, considering he can take power from the gate, first light, and wield it the same way as Sophie Renas can also gather power, or could gather power, and wield it to the way she needs it or wants it. Because if that's true, then Hunt is going to be one of the biggest weapons against the Asteri, because he need only put his hands to the quartz and draw that first energy up from beneath the throne room at the base of the palace or even the thrones themselves, as they're all made out of crystal that feed the first light into the Asteri. And first light is obviously life force, one way or another, whether it's the first light or the second light, it is still an essence or pure life force, which in Aurelia or the Throne of Glass series, that is kind of what the Volg fed on. Granted, there was a lot more of like the fear and all of that, like when they would be feeding and they would enjoy that aspect. But what was left over once they finished with a body was always a husk. So they like drained the life force right out of it. So it seems like this is why I think the Asteri are vogue. Because even though there's not this inherent sort of feeding off fear, it seems like they may have kind of evolved past that aspect and found a more stealthy way of infiltrating the worlds and feeding off that life force by creating almost that, that wheel, that animal farm of consumption by being more stealthy about it rather than so brute force and obvious. It was Sophie's strange gift, not only electricity, but first light power too. Energy of any type was hers to command to suck into herself. Her kind had been hunted to, hunted to extinction by the Asteri centuries ago because of the mighty unconquerable gift, or so it had seemed. Even though Hunt doesn't think he's a Thunderbird, I think he is a god of thunder. I really, really do. Because his gifts are exactly the same. He wields lightning. So, because Sophie is only half Thunderbird, she cannot manifest the electricity and all that 
on her own, like Hunt can. She can only absorb it and then wield it. Which is almost kind of like Bryce, because she needs that charge up and then she can wield it. But she can manifest it in different ways. The first light always hurts so much more than the electricity. Charred her insides even as it, as it left her craving more of its potent power. Why she avoided it as much as possible. When Hunt puts his hand to the gate in the bone quarter and wields that second light, he says about how it makes his insides hurt. I'm telling you, he's either pure thunderbird or a thunder god. Power fail male. So this is when her parents have come and they're at the ballet and they say, this one reminds me of Hunt looking at statues. On it, a powerful female stood, poised above an anvil, hammer raised skyward in one fist, lightning cracking from the skies, filling the hammer and flowing down towards the object of the hammer's intended blow. A sword. Just describe the making of the sword. So as if Thur isn't close enough to Thor, now we also have wielding a hammer and making of the sword. Obviously, I don't think this is the star sword that is, t that is talking about being made, but maybe it was in making Danica's sword. Because we all know there are plenty of magical swords between Prithian and Aurelia. Goldrin, Windcleaver, uh, Truth Teller, Damaris. But Danica's sword is also special. We don't know the full extent of that sword yet either. And in Prithian, we know that Helion, Helion Spellcleaver, you know, Daycourt, he has the Pegasus. Badass warrior Jelly Jubilee. Hanging on the wall was a rendering of a Pegasus, though not a unicorn Pegasus, charging into battle. An armored figured helmet obscuring any telltale features rode atop the beast's sword upraised. First Wars, JJ reporting for duty. So what if Considering in Silver Flames, they bring up, they do the, the Valkyrie training and all the rest of it. And then I know in some mythology, they say about the Valkyrie riding on Pegasus or Pegasuses, whatever the pl plural for Pegasus is. I wonder if that's going to be the end game. If the Valkyries will ride the Pegasus, because we know the prison in Prithian, which was also thought to be an eighth court back in the day, is also made of black stone and was originally home of the Pegasus. Says, say about the Fae being trapped in stone there within the walls. Now going back to Bryce and Hunt being mates. So it says here. Only one mattered, one's true lover predestined by Erd. A mate was a bond deeper than marriage and beyond an individual's control. The angels that she knew used the term far more lightly. For the Malachim, it was akin to marriage and matings could be arranged like breeding animals in a zoo. But for the Fae and the wolves, mates are as intense and seems to be exactly the same as what happens in Aurelia and Prithian. I've got a 9,000 year old Rodinian bust of Thur, basically a broody male who was supposed to pass for the nearly forgotten minor storm deity. All that remained of him in their culture was the behemoth of a planet named after him and Thursdays. Apparently Bryce had already sent a photo of it to Hunt with the comment Bryce Quinlan presents the original Alpha Hole Smolder. Twelve sphinxes around the world, each one bitchier than the last. Twelve gods that were put back through the gate by Aelin. Valbarn Fae were from Prithian. No, 
Balbarin Fey, I think, are from Aurelia, and the Avalon Fey are from Prithian. Thea's elder daughter, Helena, had the gift, married Prince Peleus. Peleus was no true prince, ate a spat. He was Thea's high general and appointed himself prince after he forcibly wed Helena. There's talk in Silver Flames about a queen and her general overthrowing the high king, the only high king of Prithian. And that was when, it was after that, that the courts divided into seven and the high lords came to be. Peleus slew Thea and stole her sword. Thea's only daughter got away and vanished into the night. What was this world before the Asteri? Ancient humans and their gods dwelled here. I've heard the ruins of their civilization are deep beneath the sea. Bryce brings up the same way Fenris and Gavriel, when they tell Rowan that he should take Aelin and flee in Empire Storms because everything seems like it's slight like leading them into place. This seems really, really similar. The prophecy that the Fae have, when knights and sword are reunited, so shall our people be. So this is Bryce when she's talking to Ruin. You have the star sword, what if, I don't know, what if there is a knife out there for me? But beyond that, what's Erd playing at? Or is it Luna? What's the end goal? You think the gods have something to do with this? Again, the hair on her arms rose, the star on her chest dimmed and went dark. After this spring, I can't help but wonder if there is something out there guiding all of this, if there is some game afoot that's, I don't know, bigger than anything we can grasp. Hell is another world, another planet. Ada said so months ago. The demons worship different gods than we do, but what happens when the worlds overlap? When demons come here, do their gods come with them? And all of us, the Vainir, we all came from elsewhere. We were immigrants into Midgard, but what became of our home world? Our home gods, do they still pay attention to us, remember us? It's a similar question that was posed when Aelin was going to be closing the gates, and the people from the southern continent, from the Cognate's army, wondered if their 36 gods would also disappear, or only these 12, which ultimately it was only the 12 who went. So the 36 gods from the southern continent, then in theory, perhaps minus 12, but still we'll stick with 36, remained. And we never got the names of all those gods. But yet, when Bryce wields the star sword for the first time, it erupts in iridescent light and she can wield it. Her power flows through it. The blade essentially sings to her and it can kill that which is unkillable. The same is anoraxia, the blade that Nesta creates because she uses it to kill that really nasty god inside the prison that escapes. Power attracts power. It is her fate to be tied to a powerful male to match her own strength. And as Bryce's power is more than that of the Autumn Kings, and we know that Hun Athalar's power also decimates what the Autumn King has, it's another like cause to like. It's another way they match his mates. His teleporting Cormac's teleporting, or as we all know it, winnowing. It was once a gift of the Starborn. It was the reason I became so focused on attaining the Star Sword. I thought my ability to teleport meant that the bloodline had surfaced in me as I had never met anyone else who can do it. His eyes guttered as he added, as you know, I was wrong. Some Starborn blood apparently, but not enough to be worthy of the blade. If this is in fact pure, completely true, and it winnowing is a starborn gift or teleporting, then it stands to reason that the people in Prithian or in the world of Akatar 
those who can winnow may be descendants of the starborn, diluted or not. Or maybe Cormac's wrong, and it's just the fact that there are a few Fae who share enough power to control or do or, or winnow, because Reese explains it to Feyre as winnowing is only gifted to some and is usually equal to their power as far as like how far they can jump and whatnot. And obviously there are plenty of people in Prithian who can winnow, not everyone, but a fair few. And from just about every single court, I do believe, even some of the highburns. The high, uh, some of the highburns could winnow, and we know Eris from the Autumn Court can. I think all the High Lords can. We know Tamlin can. Obviously, Reese can. Um, what's his name? What's his name? Elaine's mate. Lucian. We know he can winnow. But as far as we know, Elaine and Nesta cannot winnow. So I wonder, is it actually a starborn thing? Or do they just not know any better because the phase power is waning in Midgard? Primal rage poured from Hun as he faced down the shepherd and the reapers. She'd never seen anything of the sort. Hunt was the heart of a storm personified. The lightning around him turned blue like the hottest part of a flame. An image blasted through her mind. She had seen this before, carved in stone in the lobby of the CCB. A female posed like an avenging god, hammer raised to the sky, a channel for his power. Hunt unleashed his lightning at the shepherd, the reapers observing the wide eyes. Bryce was too fast even for him. She leapt in front of the blow. Star Sword extended a wild theory, only half formed, but Hunt's lightning hit the Star Sword and the world erupted. Like calls to like. Hunt is a god. And the fact her, him, oh. Hunt and Bryce's power mirror and match each other. They line up like puzzle pieces. Just like how Aelin and Rowan were Karanom. Their magic is compatible. Hunt screamed as Bryce leapt in front of his power as his lightning hit the black blade exploding from the metal, flowing up into her arm, her body, her heart. Light flashed, blinding. Power crackled from every inch of her and from the star sword she clenched in one hand as she barreled towards the shepherd. The glowing star sword pierced the thick hide. Lightning exploded across the beast's body. Lightning flowed in his veins. His body was equipped to handle raw, sizzling energy. Was this what Apollyon had hinted at? Why the prince was not only him and Bryce, but Emile and Sophie? Had the prince of the pit engineered the situation, manipulated them into coming to the bone quarter so that Hunt would be forced to realize what he could do with his own power? Perhaps Emile hadn't even come here at all. Perhaps the reapers had lied about that at Apollyon's behest just to get them here to this place, this moment. Bryce angled her sword higher, ready to fight until the end. Hunt gazed at her for a moment, an avenging angel in her own right, and then slammed his hand onto the brass plaque of the dead gate. White, blinding first light, or was it second light, flowed from the dead gate, up his arm, up his shoulder, and on the other side of the archway, the stone began to go dark, as if he were draining it. The two hounds of the shepherd merged back together, anticipating the next strike. Hunt's voice was a thunderclap as he said behind her, light it up. The words bloomed in Bryce's heart, and the same moment Hunt shot a bolt of power, the dead gate's power, into her. It burned and roared and blinded a writhing ball of energy that Bryce broke to her will and funneled into the star sword. 
The first light had flayed him, leaving a smoke and ruin inside his body, his mind, but it had worked. He had taken the power and converted it into his own, whatever the fuck that meant. Apollyon had known or guessed enough to be right, and Bryce, the sword, she'd been a conduit to his power. Tell me I'm wrong. It's right there. Tell me I'm wrong. Going back to the mate stuff, Rune sniffed her carefully. You smell different. Rune's brow twitched toward each other, and he scratched the buzz side of his head. I can't explain it. When Reese and Feyre mated, their scents entwined. It was the same when Aelin and Rowan became blood well, when Rowan became Aelin's blood sworn, their scents entwined. But it was also the fact that they were mates. Mates. Take the energy from the dead gate, transform it into lightning and all that. No, it never occurred to me to channel anything into my lightning until the prince of the pit suggested it the other night. But it made sense. You took the power out of the heart gate this spring, and Sophie Renas, as a thunderbird, could do something similar. So, even if push, the push came from the prince of the pit, trying it out seemed like a good alternative to being eaten. She wiggled her fingers in the air, all lightning berserker. He kissed her brow, running a hand down her hip. I get a little hysterical when it comes to your safety. The same as the other mates. They lose their fucking shit. Something primal. They go all, like, instinctual, one foot in the forest fey. When it comes to their mate, it is very primal. Now, the astronomer. A grey-robed male stood before them, not human, but his scent declared nothing other than some sort of vain near humanoid. Four rings of silver and gold. People call me the astronomer. What do the other people call you? The astronomer did not answer. The mystics made the first star maps. And it seems like wolves once did roam hell because... Thanatos says no wolves had roamed these lands for eons. No wolf by that name dwells here living or dead. But what are you? I mean, if the shifters are fey, you think about Aurelia and what King Arawan did with the shifters. Granted, in Aurelia, the shifters weren't fey. They were their own magical creatures, and they could shift into anything. And he melded, or Arawan melded them into like the Ilkin and the Bloodhounds and all the other various creatures and nasty things. And the Prime, the Prime tells Bryce, we did unspeakable things during the first war. We yielded our true nature lost sight of it, then lost it forever, became what we are now. We say we are free wolves, yet we have the collar of the Asteri around our necks. Their leashes are long and we let them tame us. Now we do not know how to get back to what we were, what we might have been. That was my grand, that was what my grandfather told me. What I told Sabine, though she did not care to listen. What I told Danica, who, his hand shook. I think she might as let might have led us back, you know, to what we were before we arrived here and became the Asteri's creatures inside and out. And then Rune, when he considers his mind speaking gifts. If he were to follow her that way, would he wind up in her mind, see the things she saw, look through her eyes and know who she was, where she was? Would he be able to read every thought in her head? He could speak into someone's mind, but to actually enter it, to read thoughts as his cousins in a valen could, was this how they did it? It seemed like such a gross violation, but if she invited him, if she wanted him in there, could he manage it? I do wonder if he tried, if he could. 
Lightning wrapped around Hunt's head. Rune's heart stalled a beat as it lingered like a crown, making of Hunt an anointed primal god, willing to slaughter any in his path to save the female he loved. He'd fry every single one of them if it meant getting Bryce out alive. Some intrinsic part of Rune trembled at it, whispered that he should get far, far away and pray for mercy. But Bryce didn't balk from the knee wobbling power surging around Athalar like she saw all of him and welcomed it into her heart. Hunt's eyes, nothing but pure lightning, nodded at Bryce as if to say, blind the bitch. This was how he was the day with Sandriel. Ruin said into her mind when he ripped off her head, he added tightly, you are in danger then too. And what's that supposed to mean? Why don't you tell me? You seem like you know what the fuck is happening with him. Rune glared at her as Hunt continued to glow and menace. It means that he's going ballistic in the way that only mates can when the other is threatened. It is what happened then and what is happening now. You are true mates. The way Faye are mates in your bodies and souls. That was what that was what was different about your scent the other day. Your scents have merged as they do between fey mates. She glared right back at her brother. So what? So find some way to calm him down. Athelar is your fucking problem now. Bryce's heart strained. True mates, not only in name, but in the way that fey could be mates with each other. Rune said Athelar was dangerous before, but as a mated male, he is utterly lethal. Bryce countered he was always lethal. Not like this. There's no mercy in him. He's gone lethal in a fey way. In that predatory kill all enemies way. He is an angel. Doesn't seem to matter. One look at Hunt's hard face and she knew Rune was right. Some small part of her thrilled at it that he'd descended this far into some primal instinct to try and save her. They are mates. He wanted to please his mate, his beautiful, strong mate. Hunt must have said it out loud because Bryce said, Yes, Hunt, I'm your mate. The star in her chest fluttered like an ember sputtering to life. And you are mine. That is literally what Feyre and Reese went through when they did their whole mating thing. And it was always his undoing when she says, You're mine. So... To all the haters and naysayers about Bryce and Hunt being true mates or not being true mates, they are mates. They are, they are, they are. They are. The fact that Athelar can release his full brunt of lightning on her, she can absorb it. Nothing between them hurts each other in that sense. They are a matched pair. Like calls to like. Power levels match up, just how Reese is the, the strongest Prithian or High Lord in the history of Prithian, and Feyre. <laughs> Feyre is also the first of her kind in the history of Prithian, so they're matched. They're matched. Then we have Ariadne, which we know is not her real name. We'll get more of her in CC3 because she is definitely part of Flame and Shadow. And one of the sprites even say that the astronomer is an ancient sorcerer. Which is why I think that and the whole thing with the little black box that had the rings in. I think the astronomer might be Kosche. But I don't know how he could be in two places at once if you line the timelines up, unless he can move between the worlds. But I don't think so, because he was trapped at the lake. So... I'm not sure. The Ocean Queen is older than the Asteri, and yet the Asteri have never been able to destroy her. But I don't think we're going to get anything about the Ocean Queen until we get to the House of Many Waters which was probably going to be book four. And Jessica, Jessica knows of Ariadne. Again, not by that name. Yeah, the dragon Ariadne. Is that what she calls herself? A low laugh. Fascinating. You know of her? Of her. Dragonfire dating back 5,000 years. 
Maeve mentions dragons in the land of Aurelia because she pushes Aelin onto the pile. Well, she has, what's his name, push Aelin onto the, the pile of dragon glass as like a bit of a fuck you to Aelin because of her fire gifts. So, dragon fire dating back 5,000 years. It was in a language Bryce didn't know, but a translation was included. Jessup ascribed good luck at the top. Among its many uses, the ancient scholar had written, dragon fire is one of the few substances proven to harm the princes of hell. It can burn even the prince of the pit's dark hive. We know fire is definitely dangerous against Vogg, though the Asteri don't seem to be quite so about fire so much as they are about the Thunderbirds. In fact, so the Avalon Fae, even the Asteri cannot pierce its mist without permission, so old is the magic that guards it. And the Avalon Fae were the ones that were herded over from Prithian. Prithian obviously kicked the Asteri's asses out of their world. So whatever magic they're wielding works well against them. Again, it reminds me of the middle. The fact that you know Amarantha set herself up under the mountain. Uh, but besides that, it was also known as the Sacred Mountain. But you never learn why. Just like Ramiel, Sacred Mountain, and all that jazz. And it has the black stone thingy on the top that teleports you when you touch it. Kind of like a gate. Six-pointed star, symbol of balance, she explained, moving away a foot but keeping the dagger at her side, her crown of cloud bracing to glow with the inner light. Two intersecting triangles, male and female, dark and light, above and below, and the power that lies in the place where they meet. Her face became grave. It is that place of balance where I focus my power. So the fact that those six gates, or sorry, seven gates, they create a giant six-pointed star. That cannot be coincidence. And the Underking seems to have some kind of working knowledge of word marks. As he lifts a bony hand and an eerie greenish light wreathed his fingers, Ethan could have sworn ancient strange symbols swirled in that light. So we know that Nehemia could do stuff like that with her fingers using word marks. Then the greenish light, the king, uh, Erewhon, there's always this thing about greenish light, greenish flame, when it came to the Volg. And then Parthos, the way it's described, it also sounds like that world where the demons were that Aelin accidentally enters. She stood on a vast dusty plain before an azure cloudless sky. Distant dry mountains studded the horizon, but she was surrounded only by rock and sand and emptiness. And then you have Thea. So she fought against the Asteri, but Peleus fought for the Asteri. So the Asteri must have promised Peleus power. Orion was bred to be receptive to our kind. Why do you think he is so adept at hunting us? Let's not forget that Danica's mate wasn't a wolf. Baxian, who's also an angel, but he can shapeshift into a dog or a hound. The fae queen Thea and her two foolish daughters realized that, though too late, her people were already here, but she and the princesses discovered where my siblings had hidden the access points in their world. Your starborn ancestors shut the gates to stop us from invading their realm once more and reminding them who their true masters are, and in the process they shut the gates to all other worlds, including those to hell, their stalwart allies. And so we have been trapped here, cut off beneath 
from the cosmos, all that is left of our people, though our mystics beneath the palace have long sought to find any other survivors. Danica realized that the shifters are fae. Not your fine kind of fae, of course. Your breed dwelled in a lovely verdant land, rich with ma magic. If it's of any interest to you, your starborn bloodline specifically hailed from a small isle a few miles off the mainland, and while the mainland had all manner of climes, the isle existed in beautiful, near-permanent twilight. But only a select few in the entirety of your world could shift from their humanoid forms to animal ones. The Midgard shifters were fey from different from a different planet, all the fae in that world shared their form with an animal. The mare descended from them too. Perhaps they once shared a world with your breed of fae, that they had been alone on their planet for long enough to develop their own gifts. They don't have pointed ears. We bred that out of them. It was gone within a few generations. And obviously, Rune and the Hind our mates. It was a mask he'd seen the real face moments ago, had joined his body and soul with her days ago. He knew what fire burned there. They are definitely mates. And again, this is why I think the Asteri are vogue. I really do. He appeared as a fey boy of 17 or so, dark haired and gangly, a weak facade to veil the ancient monster beneath. And the fact they feed on life force. So Bryce's starlight will glow when close to undiluted bloodlines of the original world of the Fae, like Prince Cormac. It also glowed for Hun. It also glows for those who you choose as your loyal companions, knights, almost like the Bloodsworn. So that star will lead us back to that world through you. They overthrew our brethren who once ruled there. We have not forgotten. Our initial attempts at revenge was foiled by your ancestors who also bore that star on her chest. The Fae will have not atoned for the deaths of our brothers and sisters. Their home was rich in magic. I crave more of it. So yeah, Amran even names the sword Gwydan, which is brought up in House of Sil- A Court of Silver Flames. And that concludes the notes that I took from Zeus. So with that, I am waiting with bated breath for Tuesday. I will probably stay up until midnight on Monday so I can start the book then. Granted, my copies, my physical copies won't be arriving. I don't know. I ordered one from Amazon, which I'm hoping will arrive on the 30th, but considering how Iron Flame went, I'm not holding my breath. And I've also got a digitally signed copy coming from Bloomsbury, but again, I don't think that'll be on the 30th. And I am too impatient to have to wait for my physical copy to arrive before I start listening to my pre-ordered audiobook. So I think I'll be doing the audiobook first and then going again with the physical copy to take my notes, which I will then put together another vlog for next Friday to hopefully be proven right on at least a couple of my ideas with any luck. <laughs> but anyways, thank you guys so much for coming along on this month of Sarah J Mass Madness. It's been an amazing ride. Always so much fun doing the rereads. And I will talk to you next week. And please let me know in the comments below what you think. If you think I am way off base, if you think I might have some ideas, you know, and don't forget to subscribe, like, share, all that fun stuff. All three ways you can support me and my channel because I upload content like this every single week. And let me know if you want me to go into more in-depth like charts and whiteboards with my ideas and theories with stuff to do with this universe, then again, do let me know. I feel like I harp on a little bit about Sarah J Mass because I am not just a slight tad bit obsessed, but yes. Okay, my darlings, much love. I will see you next time.